Robinson. He even went down the sideline and he's got Cass Decker bringing you UCLA football content all throughout the year for LA Football Network. What is good, Bruin Bible listeners? It is your host, Will Decker. We got to get a sponsor in before we start this episode. It's Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your basketball info, stats, news, and scores. Get the latest odds and lines and the latest matchup reports for this year's NBA playoffs. Bet Online is your sports intel headquarters this season as we have you covered for your insider sports wagering needs from basketball, Major League Baseball, NHL, hockey, golf, to UFC and boxing. The fastest and easiest way to get your betting info, including live betting options and your favorite casino and card games available to play right from your home. Make sure you check out Bet Online. Get into the action today. So head to the website or use your mobile device. To join and be sure to use your promo code BELIEVE to receive your 50% bonus on your first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. Now to the Bruin Bible. What is up and welcome to a very special edition of the Bruin Bible. Will Decker and your co-host Jamal Madney in the house. We have, I mean, your former, your former signal caller and current wide receivers coach for UCLA, it's a great day to be alive and be a Bruin. We got Mr. Jerry Neuheisel in the house. Jerry, how are you doing? You're so thrilled to have you on the Bruin Bible. Well, I first and foremost, it is always a great day to be alive and be a Bruin. Um, yes, but sir. I appreciate you guys having me. This is awesome. I've seen a couple of my teammates been able to do this, so uh, I'm excited. I finally made the cut. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things. It's a lot like my football career as a player. I just had to wait my time, and uh, officially my name has now been called, and I get to join the Bruin Bible. Well, man, it's such an honor to have you. We kind of want to go into all of your background within the football world. You know, what made you choose UCLA? I know I've got a really good reason as to why. You, you know, your mom, Susan, went there. Your dad, Rick, obviously started for some of those Rose Bowl teams. Uh, you know, a big game that we'll get into talking about. All the way up into your coaching and, you know, what are you thinking of the current roster? But let's start off on the rip. I mean, was there any other option for you, realistically, <laughs> Jerry, knowing you're in Los Angeles, you're at Loyola High School, you know, you can choose to go to a couple of different areas. Was there any other choice but UCLA at the end of the day in uh, 2011 for you, man? Well, people don't know this. I was actually born at UCLA too. So it was kind of, it was kind of always destined to be. In fact, my dad was the receiver coach at the time, which was his first job in football, ironically, and now my first full-time gig in football. So uh, I guess the apple did not fall far from the tree. But to be honest, I, I remember being eight years old and my dad was the head coach at Washington and we were going to play Purdue in um, the Rose Bowl. And so we had done all the trips. We had gone to Disney World and we'd done all that stuff. And my dad swung us over, I think like two days before the game real quick, just to come check out campus. And I just remember being there and being like, wow, this place is something really special. So come full circle. Now I, we, my dad gets the head coaching job here. I'm a sophomore at Loyola. I don't think there was ever a chance I was going somewhere else. I did take one trip to Idaho. Um, that was, I actually had a lot of fun, thought about it, thought, you know, maybe there's a chance for me to play earlier. But at the end of the day, I thought, you know, I'm going to bet on myself and give myself a chance to play here at UCLA, just kind of like my dad did. And uh, to be honest, it worked out perfect. Worked out perfect. It did. And you were a part of Arguably one of the more memorable UCLA games the last 15 years. You know exactly the date I'm talking about, Jerry. <laughs> September 13th, 2014, we're in Jerry's world. We're playing a blue blood program in the University of Texas. Our guy Brett Hundley gets injured. You got to come in and step up for our UCLA Bruins. Jerry, that's an understatement. You hit Jordan Payton on a 33-yard bomb. A beautiful pump fake right into the rhythm on the left sideline, man. Can you take us through what that day meant to you as somebody that, you know, your parents are UCLA alums, you got family members, all UCLA alums, and you get to go out and deliver a big time win for UCLA at Jerry's world. I mean, that that's as good as it gets right there. It, it was honestly pretty crazy to be honest. The, the coolest part to me is how many people 
come up to me and tell me either they were at that game or that was one of their favorite games of all time. Um, a lot of people come up like it was like a national championship or a Rose Bowl. People forget it was the third game of the year. Uh, it was, and it shouldn't have been that big a game, but but it really was. And and to be honest, I was really really fortunate to have really good teammates. Um, I, for most of that game, I just handed the ball off left and right to Paul Perkins, who had a career day that day. I think he went for like 180 yards. I think the f- first play out of the second half, we hit inside zone, and he goes from the 20-yard line all the way down inside the 10-yard line, and we score three plays later. But it was uh, it was an unbelievable game. And, and to be there with my team, my favorite part of the whole game is not the pass. As many people think, that is probably the best ball I will ever throw in my entire life that I threw to Jordan Payton. <laughs> to, although I would still say I still got it. So you can ask some of the receivers on the roster. I still have, I still got at least a couple more years left in this arm. But my favorite part was I got to give a halftime speech. I had actually kicked the offensive coordinator, Noel Mazzoni, out of the locker room at the time and gave a halftime speech to the team. And it, to this day, goes back as one of my favorite moments I've ever had being a part of UCLA. And for me to get carried off the field that day, and I, for me, I had like 40 family members there. It is, it is honestly such a dream come true. Um, I ideally would have loved to play more than just that game, but if that was the best one game career, I think uh, any UCLA quarterback could ever ask for. You did, man. I mean, you got carried off the field. I heard them chanting Jerry, Jerry, going into the locker room. Yeah, I got to thank Jerry Springer for that because I don't yeah. think I'm the one who created that chance. So, uh, RIP to Jerry Springer, but I think I owe him a little bit of credit on that one too. Man, well, the chant will live on forever in UCLA fans' hearts. You kind of alluded to my next question with Noel Mazzoni. Uh, you followed him as mm-hmm. your first kind of coaching gig. You played in Japan. You went to the Japan Bowl, did some things out there, and then you decide you want to get into coaching. Two-part question here. What made you want to follow in your dad's footsteps to be a coach? And two, how did you link up with Noel Mazzoni going to Texas A&M for your first stint as a coach? I think coaching to me was always kind of a foregone conclusion. I think what was so cool is we moved a lot of times, right? And when, when you're in football and you grow up with a coach, um, if you're winning too much, you're normally moving. And if you're losing too much, you're moving. There's really never a, a middle ground where you're staying somewhere unless you're in one of those dream jobs like UCLA is or, or something like that. But for the most part, we, I mean, I moved, I think I went to 14 different schools. I lived in 11 different houses and we moved all over five different states. But what was cool is when we moved, you know, you didn't really have any friends until it basically came to the second week of August and you go to practice and then you had 50 new friends. And, and to me, that camaraderie and what makes football so special and the fact that there has to be 11 people on the field, they do 11 different jobs and you have to count on each other. Like there was something so special about the team part of that to me that it was whatever way I could stay in football. That's what I wanted to do. And my favorite part, honestly, was the X's and O's part of it. And, and I kind of got to develop that not only with growing up with my dad and being in those meetings, but also being with Coach Mazzoni. Um, when I was actually a player, Coach Mazzoni let me do the breakdown of the opponent scout. So rather than a graduate assistant doing anything like that, I used to do basically break down every player on their defense, what their scheme is, things like that for our entire offense. And so I think he was already grooming me to eventually work for him one day um, and know exactly what he wanted in the breakdowns. But I was in Japan, which is a long story. It is one of the coolest experiences of my life. Um, But I just remember getting a call from him and he said, I got a spot for you and you're done playing in Japan. It's time to come work for me. And it's this real moment where you sit there and go, do I want to be, you know, in Japan for a bunch more years or is it time to, you know, go what I really want to do, which is my dream is to eventually be the head coach at UCLA. And, And at that point, you know, you can't really pass up that experience of being in the SEC and kind of be learning to coach under somebody who, who would have your back like coach Mazzoni has always had mine so it was an unbelievable unbelievable opportunity that I couldn't pass up now moving from Tokyo to college station is like moving to the other side of the moon <laughs> um, that, that was an interesting interesting adjustment but I loved it absolutely loved it and still talk to him all this day um, and uh, right now he runs a quarterback sim in Arizona and it's, it's one of the coolest places I've been to hang out but it, it was an unbelievable opportunity that I just couldn't pass up to go work for him Jerry, that's so awesome uh, to hear and, you know, to sort of talk about your journey. And I can certainly relate being being the son of a, of a Bruin as well. And so, you know, so, so many parallels there. Jerry, how would you say you've changed since the beginning of your coaching journey to now? You know, what, how do you feel in terms of relatability to the player on the field, X's and O's, just you as sort of a person and your leadership style? 
how would you say you have kind of changed or evolved since the start? Uh, I would say you just you just kind of discover more and more about yourself. Like as you go through it, luckily, because we're with Coach Kelly and we have connections to all these coaches we've been around. I mean, Dana Bible, who I got a chance to work under, was in the room when they invented the West Coast offense. So when you're talking to somebody who knows pass game, that's probably the best guy to, to have in your corner. And with Noel Mazzoni and all, all the guys I've been fortunate enough to work with. And, and on top of that, with Coach Kelly's connections and us being able to go and, you know, clinic with other people, you just start to learn and you accumulate more and more knowledge and you become a little bit more comfortable here and a little bit more comfortable here. And so it's I wouldn't say you've changed. I think you just mature. And I think the one thing that I can always relate to is, you know, for most of the guys that I get to coach, I, I did it. You know, I, I was in their shoes not too long ago. In fact, uh, I took most of the same classes they took with most of the same teachers they took. Um, and so I try to help them out any way I can, especially. But I think it, it's one of those things where this is a, such a cool situation for me and hard for me to imagine wanting to be anywhere else because the type of student athlete we get to work with here at UCLA is different. And I've been fortunate enough to be at some other spots, but there's nothing like a UCLA guy. And, and there's very few places in the country that can literally say they're trying to be the best at everything they do. We're the number one public university. We're trying to be, you know, we've got 121 national championships now after the recent volleyball national championship, congrats to them. But it's a really special place and it demands a lot of the student athlete and the people who sign up for that are the reason that, you know, I am excited to go to work every day. And it's awesome. Bruin Bible listeners. We've got a special sponsor uh, for today's episode. It is AG1. AG1 has been something that I've really enjoyed using in my spare time. 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, and whole source food nutrients in one scoop that you can use into your water. You stir it up. I use it before my workouts, before I start my day, and it has totally given me the energy I need to do the little things in life, like going to work, getting extra, you know, an extra boost, a second wind, if you will, for a workout before I play pickleball with my friends. Just it puts you in a good spirit of mind, and you know you're doing the healthiest possible thing by putting AG1 in your body. Make sure to check us out and get a special deal with the Bruin Bible it's www.drinkag1.com slash Bruin Bible to get the special deal that we provide. Once again, www.drinkag1.com slash Bruin Bible to get that special deal. Now back to the Bruin Bible. Absolutely, man. And Chip Kelly, I mean, you're at Texas A&M, I think for a year. Is that correct? Yeah, one year. Unfortunately, that's the same year they had the comeback. And that was a weird Oh, moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most people forget I was on the other sideline, although it was our sideline because I was used to running out and being on the sunny side. That was like the first year they went over to the shady side. So it felt normal to me. I was still running out of the same tunnel that I had always <laughs> run out of. But it was weird because as we're watching it happen, we're up, we're winning, and I'm excited. We're in the Rose Bowl, and all of a sudden, here comes the comeback. And the weirdest part is I played with most of the guys that were across from me on the other side of the field. So I just remember this moment after the game, which Jordan Glasley was out of bounds. Now, it works out great for Bruin fans, so I'm not upset. <laughs> it did lead to me, unfortunately, not being at AM anymore, so it's a little bittersweet. But um, I just remember look, going over, and I gave Josh – uh, Rose in a big hug. And I just told him that's the coolest thing ever. And I just tried to cover my mouth so that no one would hear me say it. Cause I didn't want anyone to know that I was still secretly a Bruin at heart. Even <laughs> but, um, but yeah, one year at A&M and then, uh, and now I'm here and then they can't get rid of me over here at UCLA. So what's the conversation like Chip Kelly, who for a lot of football minds, we believe he is one of, if not the smartest offensive coaches within the entire country. What's the conversation like for you to come back home to UCLA? And I was wondering if you could just tell us, because we're on the outside looking in, what it's like to be in the offensive scheming room with a genius like Chip Kelly calling the plays on offense. Well, I'll end the debate. He is. He is. He is the very best. Uh, the very best you could ever be around. But most people don't give him credit for what an amazing human being he is and how good he is to the players and how much he truly cares. And most of that is because the media only gets a small snippet of what it is. And, and, and I would, he is the greatest person I could ever work for. Um, but, you know, he had actually done a clinic or he'd come to sit with us at AM for about three days. 
Um, so he sat in our staff meetings, was kind of helping us go over offense, kind of going over what he had been doing in the NFL and, and Oregon and kind of seeing what we could kind of implement um, on our side. And I got a chance to meet him. So I had his phone number and I had heard through the grapevine he was going to get the job. And so I, I remember I was so nervous to call because I didn't want to like bug him. Like I wasn't really supposed to have his number, but I, I gave him a call, left him a voicemail. And I remember after he got the job, he gave me a call back and said, be here January 1st. And the rest is history. Um, in terms of being in that meeting room, it, it's pretty special. Most of the time you're just sitting there. He lets us say our ideas and, and you know, it's a lot of give and take in terms of what we think the defense is going to do. And then you're, we're all just kind of sitting on pins and needles until he tells us what the new stuff that's going to go in is. And it's most of the time from somewhere that we had never really thought of a different angle, things like that. And so for me, you know, learning from him and being that, like you just learn to see the game a different way, you attack it a different way. And, and it's been an unbelievable learning experience and, and one that I think will help me grow and has, you know, made me a better coach day in and day out. Jerry, you know, your dad played at, you know, arguably sort of the peak era of UCLA football in the eighties, obviously, we, you know, we won a national championship in 54, but but a lot can sort of point to the 80s as the peak of sort of modern UCLA football, three Rose Bowls in four years competing for, uh, you know, conference titles year in and year out. I believe, you know, six consecutive uh, bowl victories and, and really kind of coach Donahue and, and the peak there. When you look at the program today and you look at, you know, how it's sort of coming together with Chip, with others, where do you see this program on that ultimate road? And, and what do you think the program needs to do in terms of the final two, three, four things to get back to that place where they're competing for conference titles every year and, and competing for big New Year's games every year? It's an interesting question just because I refuse to accept that that's the peak. Um, mm. to, to be honest, I, I not taking anything away, although I will say my dad – kind of backed himself into a Rose Bowl. I do think it was like a three-way tie and they had to get in on a tie break. <laughs> Not taking anything away. There is a jersey in my grandpa's uh, my grandpa's office that he makes sure I see every time I go to visit. And he tells me all the time, I owe him a Rose Bowl watch. So if he <laughs> listens to this, grandpa, I'm still working on it. But I, I would say this, this program is now set on a trajectory where I think it could go places it's never been before. And, and to be honest, that's what excites me. You know, Doing something that's never been done before at a place like UCLA, where so much history has been made, you know, with John Wooden, with Arthur Ashe, with everything, all the 121 national championships. Like if that doesn't get you up in the morning, then I don't know what will. And I still think there's history and there's records and there's things that we can still go chase and, and really do something that's probably never been done here before. And if that's not what your goal is, then I don't know why you'd be at a place like mm. this. And especially when you're around so many other teams where they are playing in national championships every year for us, it's about getting the right pieces and the right development. And if you look at it, I think we're doing a really good job right now. You know, we've actually put more guys in the NFL over the past two years than any other school in terms of 90 man rosters. We've put 28 guys in the NFL over the past two years. Um, the development piece is coming. The football piece is coming. I think if the ball bounces our way a couple different times, I think the season might have ended up with a couple more wins rather than how it did. Now, that's not taking anything away from our opponents that they ended up with more points. And that's just the way it kind of shook out. But I'm excited about where we're going. And I think we've got the right, right blend of, you know, guys in that locker room who are not only good football players, but they're really good people. And those are the guys you can kind of count on on third down to make sure that they're, they're going to do the right thing and make the catch and make the plays. And we just got to keep working. I think it's one of those things where you just got to have the right concoction of the right players at the right time, at the right moment. And when that hits, everyone wants to look back, like what caused it? And it's sometimes it's just, you got to make a little bit of your own luck. And, and it's about putting in the work right now to make sure we can make a little bit of luck come November uh, and October and September. Absolutely, Jerry. And you got promoted to wide receivers coach in 2021. The current iteration of the wide receiver room, for my money, is the deepest I've ever seen at UCLA. When you talk about the returning talent, you got your Cam Browns, you got your Logan Loyas, your TMAs, and then you got these two new transfers coming in with a Kyle Ford and a J. Michael Sturdivant, as well as a developing young gun. We were able to watch some of the spring practices. Braden Pagan's going to be a dog. I'm really yeah. excited for what Pagan can bring to the table. Do you mind breaking down some of the players in your receiving room and where your guys' strengths are at as we left spring? 
shoot, how much time do you guys have? We can go through. I've never, <laughs> called, I've never heard Titus called TMA before. So that <laughs> might, I, I might take credit for that. Because we're giving him the OBJ. Please do. Please do. We've, been, we've been calling him TMA for, for a year. I've so please never do. Heard <laughs> TMA. i got to ask him if he likes it, but I kind of dig TMA. The hardest part right now with the receiver room is we've just brought in Jerry McClure. So it's the first time somebody. Yeah. I think the whole time I was at UCLA, I never met another Jerry, except for Jerry Rice Jr., which which I get. <laughs> he has to be named Jerry as well. But, like, that's been the hardest part is now I can't be Coach Jerry anymore. It's got to be Coach – I'm like, it's this weird conundrum where we can't have two Jerrys in the room. But in, in terms of our room, I think we return a lot of talent. Now, we're going to miss Jake Bobo and Kaz. Um, yeah. I think Bobo it, it was such an unbelievable route runner at the top of the route and had an unbelievable knack to create separation and was really football smart. And Kaz was dynamic and I mean, made more plays in that return game than I think we'd ever give him credit for. Uh, and a lot of the times, maybe it didn't end up in a touchdown, but we had such good field position to where we're starting the ball in the 40, starting the ball in the 50. Like their impact really can't be understated. But but as you come back, you know, Cam is going to be a third year starter for us. Um, he's coming back and, and he's never dropped the ball here at UCLA. And all he's done is be productive. And so that's something that you you got to really hang your hat on. You've had Logan Loya, who had really some breakout plays last year. And I'm really excited about his progress. This is the best he's ever looked in spring ball. Um, that 70 yard touchdown is still it's at Utah. My memory at Utah. Yeah. We needed it the most right after a penalty, too. I was like, oh, my God, you have no idea how big a play that was. <laughs> um, and then Titus to be honest, is one of those steady Eddie players who can make a play anytime we want. And that bowl game kind of exemplifies exactly what he can be, you know, and we, the two transfers, I mean, with J Mike and Kyle Ford, both were productive at their previous places. And it's about integrating them into our system and trying to find a way to, you know, do using what they do best to make us a better team. And, you know, the interesting thing about football is I think you all want to be greater than the sum of your, or the collection of your parts, right? The sum of what your pieces are. So we have to find different ways to where everyone has a role on the team and can make us a better team rather than all trying to do the same thing. Um, and if you look at the younger guys, you know, Braden Pig and Jaden Marshall, Jeremiah McClure, who just came in. And then we have a bunch of um, walk-ons who are honestly have really pushed and elevated our scout team in terms. And then I've all been trying to push to get playing time. You know, you've got Bradley Shlom, who's been there a long time, Devontae Dillard, you've got, you know, Elijah Rodriguez, you've got Xavier Staples, who's finally coming off injury now. Like this, this room is really deep and it's really good guys. And it's something I'm really excited to come for. So hopefully, hopefully, as I tell them all the time, they just got to go make a lot of plays in practice. So I got a lot of ammo when I'm going to the table, trying to ask for pass plays um, when we get into game planning stuff. But um, I'm really excited about where they are right now. And it's about, you know, staying healthy, making sure we're doing the right things, uh, making sure we're, you know, developing the way we should during camp and then give us a, hopefully a good chance to throw some passes against Coastal Carolina week one. Yeah, Jerry, you know, that's, a, that's such a key word you you use right there is in terms of development and, and developing kind of that talent pipeline now and moving forward. I want to talk a little bit about the recruiting trail. And so when you're, when you're in, in the living rooms, when you're interacting with the high school player of today or, you know, a transfer prospect of today, the game has changed so much in terms of the externalities and the ecosystem. We've got nil, we've got, you know, the, the transfer portal being what it is now. When you walk in to a living room, how much is the modern player thinking about nil opportunities and endorsements and playing right away versus the balance of being a little bit more forward thinking in terms of development and in terms of getting a quality education yeah. like UCLA. You know, we've talked so much about how UCLA is such a unique and different place. Do you cater the recruiting style given what UCLA is? And, and just how, how does that kind of shake out now in, in today's game? I, I would say it's different for every player. So it's really hard to like kind of put an umbrella on what every situation is. I think what we're really fortunate is, is that we kind of attract a certain type of player. The guys that want to come to us, and that's why we always try to make sure they come to a practice. You know, I mean, we've been on the recruiting trail. To be honest, I'm really proud of where this class is. I, and I forgot to mention, but Grant Gray's coming in. Carter Shaw is coming in, who, who's, you know, just ran a 10-6 in the 100 meter right at the end of this. Like, these guys understand the value of what the development piece is. And they understand that, you know, it's about where we are in the end. It's not about, you know, okay, this amount of money now, this amount of money then. Uh, you know, I'm not allowed to really get involved in any of that stuff. So so I don't. But what I can tell them is, you know, this is a 
proven track record. You're coming to a place that has developed NFL players before you will continue to develop NFL players, but is also going to make sure we take care of you. All right. We, we put everyone on a three and a half year graduation plan, if not faster, so that after your junior year, when you're draft eligible, you will have a degree in hand, which is really important to us. Um, and then most of our guys, I think we'll probably have some of probably the highest numbers in terms of people in graduate school. I mean, Chase Griffin, I think, is working on a doctorate. I don't know if he'll ever leave UCLA. But it, it's we are really, really, really lucky that we get guys who almost self-select themselves into this. This is a school that demands a lot. It demands people that want to be great at everything they do. And, and guys that want to be like that kind of really – find themselves to UCLA and they want to be in that locker room. They want to be a part of it. And so the one thing that I'm really appreciative of is that we've recruited the right guys and the right type of people. And, and that locker room environment is really good. And it's, it's got a culture in it right now that is more players, more player led than coach fed, um, which is the old adage, but I'm really proud of the guys that are in that locker room. And it's kind of set us up for success, not only hopefully now, but in the future as well. Coach, I was wondering if you could just dote on your guys a little bit. Jake Bobo and Kaz Allen. Uh, Bobo, you know, it seemed like every time UCLA needed a big catch on a third down or a fourth down situation last year, Bobo was going to come down with that and move the chains for UCLA. I was in awe of his red zone route running and everything he did on that front. Then you mentioned Kaz Allen. That. Thank you. That was all coaching. That has nothing yeah. to do with <laughs> all coaching. Um, so I appreciate that. You can keep doting on them. <laughs> we, we had to give credit where it's due with all the route running and the coaching that came with it. And then Kaz Allen. I mean, what a Swiss Army knife that guy was. You know, the, the game that comes to mind for me is when Charbonnet, Charbonnet went out against Arizona State. And you guys basically had to insert Kaz Allen in as a running back. And this guy tore up, you know, a legitimate Division One defense playing a, a completely different position. Both were undrafted. Both are in good spots within Washington in Seattle and early camp reports are saying they're both doing great. Talk about your guys for me, coach, because I feel like they went too far under the radar for these NFL scouts. You know, I think it's not how you get in the league. It's how you stay in the league. I think there's a lot of stories about guys that it's not always pretty, right? Sometimes you bounce around a couple of teams. It it really takes the right situation. And I think not to take anything away, but once you get to the end of that draft, sometimes it works out better to be in that free agent setup because you can kind of pick and choose where you want to go, which is the right kind of setup for where you want to be and kind of an offense that fits you or a special team system that kind of needs a fit like that. So uh, I'm excited about both those guys. And Kaz Allen is one of the most dynamic football players with the ball in his hand I've ever been around. It was when he made the switch from being a running back to a receiver, my only selling point to him was, you know, when you run between the tackles and there's a million people around you, what if I could get you the ball and there'd be one person out there that you have to make miss? He's like, that's a great point. I was like, perfect. Come play a little receiver for us. But I I think no matter where he is, as long as the ball's in his hands, he's got unbelievable vision and unbelievable ability to get to the end zone. And, And he's proven that over years, especially in the return game. Bobo was, we got really lucky. You know, he was a grad transfer from Duke who was going through a coaching change. And, you know, when we called David Cutcliffe, he said he was one of the, him and Peyton Manning were some of the two best practice players he's ever had in his entire career. Mm -hmm. But for us, we were like, done deal. Like, signed, sealed, delivered, just what can we do to get him here? And when he came here, he did everything that we thought he would. He was an unbelievable practice player. He did every day, regardless of how he feels. And, you know, I mean, is an old man compared to the rest of those guys. So he had to do his whole knee warm ups. He had a whole little routine he had to do. <laughs> but he was he's still one of the best receivers I've ever seen at the top of the route. And, and I, I don't want to give away his secrets because if somebody in the NFL were to hear this, but he, he is so good at creating separation, which is to me the mark of being a good versus a great receiver. I think there's a lot of, you know, emphasis placed on Instagram in terms of releasing and make people falling over uh, at the line of scrimmage. But at the end of the day, at the top of the route, if you can win from point A to point B, mm-hmm. um, that's a great receiver. And he proved it over and over again. I think, I think last year he had around 62 catches. I think 48 of them were for first downs. Yeah. And you know, all he did was make big time catches, regardless of how many people were hanging on him, regardless of if they held him or not. I mean, I'm br- brought back to that catch he had against Oregon where he had the one handed catch, which was just, oh, yeah. but he made me look really smart. So for that, I thank Bobo all the time, but it, it's just indicative of kind of what we have in that room. You know, we have a r- lot of really football smart guys who know where to be and when to be there and know how to create separation. And uh, we're just hoping uh, we just get a couple more opportunities here and there this year to make more plays. 
Jerry, I'll, I'll, you know, last question, we'll, we'll sort of leave you with this. Looking forward in, in a more kind of reflective space here, five years, 10 years, 15 years down the line, where do you sort of, where, where's the ultimate calling? Where's I have, dream? I'm going to put you on the spot. I have predicted for a few years that, that my dream, you know, 10 years from now or, or however many years from now is that you ultimately become the coach of UCLA because I think that it just, it, it, it fits so beautifully. How do you, I mean, how are you enjoying kind of the coaching journey? Is this what you sort of see moving forward for yourself? Do you see kind of a, a particular side of the ball eventually, or just, you know, maybe you could talk about what is maybe your vision for your coaching yeah. future. I, I think you said it. <laughs> I mean, to me growing up, what could be better than being the head coach here? And, and I just think playing in the Rose bowl, there's still something special about it. Like there is, especially as we go conferences and now you're going to see some, the Michigans, the Iowa's, the Penn States, the Ohio States are going to be in the Rose bowl in October. Like, why would you want to be anywhere else in the world? And I guess it's a little bit naive of me to think that you could stay at one school your entire career um, and, you know, work your way up from being a GA to a position coach, to a coordinator, to a head coach. Um, but why wouldn't you go after it? I think it, it's, it's only as crazy as it is until somebody actually does it. And so, yeah, that's the eventual goal. But I think what I've learned from this career, if anything, is when you start looking ahead, you start to forget about what's really happening right now. Mm. And, and to be honest, as much as I am looking forward to whatever my career might bring, my, my favorite part's always just going to be coaching the guys. So for now, it's just making sure that we, we know what our routes are going to be. We line up correctly. We're on the ball when we're supposed to be. And uh, we make sure that when we watch film after the first practice here in August, that we're not getting yelled at too bad. And there's not too many corrections that need to be had. But ideally, yes, I would love to be the head coach here. I would love to win national championships. Or I would love to do all that stuff. And not like I don't think about it. But at the end of the day, I think when you start thinking that far down the road, you start you don't give the guys that are currently in that room um, the, the attention and respect they deserve. So for now, we're just making sure we are healthy and we will know our stuff come August uh, when we start camp. Well, it is truly a great day to be alive and be a Bruin once Listen, again. Listen, this shirt, this shirt, I don't have yes. one. I'm well, willing to pay full price. It is my face, though, so I feel like absolutely I absolutely not. We are going to give you that shirt. That was the the vision was for that shirt, and we're very proud that we came up with that concept. We want you to wear it proudly, and and but, that that is our gift to you, Jerry. Be a thing, and I actually we started doing it at the beginning of our fight song. We've done the fight song forever, and. We get so much flack for it. So if anybody listens, we've done that fight song where we spray the water after every single game for as long as I've been around UCLA. <laughs> so since 2008, we've done the exact same fight song. So everyone got mad at us, like depending on what game. I'm like, most people have no idea what it takes from a Monday through a Friday to get ready for that game. Regardless of your opponent, that's so much work. So to win that game and have more points, like you got to enjoy them when you get them. So we've done that fight song. Then we added that first part. It's a great day to be alive and be a Bruin. And it is like taken off and everyone loves it. And it's my favorite thing in the world. I'll be walking around Westwood and people will tell me that. And um, it is, it is always a great day to be alive and be a Bruin. So it is pretty cool, but I do want the shirt. So if I could rep the shirt, I, I will wear it. I will, I will show it as soon as we go to uh, our first game. I have no doubt I will wrap it on the field so we can get. Um, oh, so my, that'll be amazing, Jerry. Shirts. We would love it that. It is a cool, cool shirt. Well, man, DM us the details. Jerry, I just want to thank you so much again, Coach, for coming on. Uh, really meant a lot to us. And we wish you nothing but success, as you know, ruined by. But we are cheering for UCLA year in and year out, my man. So thank you so much for coming on the Bible once oh, again, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys having me. Tr tr truly, this was an audition. I I'm hoping this turns into a segment where I can come on more often um, because I, I would love to be able to hang out with you guys a little bit more. But I appreciate oh, you guys having me today. Would We'd absolutely love, to have you love on, that. Man. Absolutely. The door awesome. is always open for you, Jerry. Absolutely. Okay. Anytime. Okay, perfect. But don't, don't call me after a loss and then want me to say a bunch <laughs> of bad stuff. You know? <laughs> I'm more than happy to come over after any win or any touchdowns our guys catch. No problem whatsoever. Awesome. Coach, we're looking forward to it, man. Bruin Bible, we are officially 